Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 15th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. I'd ask everyone at this point, as I usually do, to switch off mobile phones as they can often interfere with the sound system. But you will also note that um, some officials and members will be using tablet devices instead of hard copies of our papers. Um, our first item on the agenda today is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, and I invite the committee to agree that we take item six on today's agenda in private. Can I have the committee's agreement? Thank you. We now move quickly to agenda item number two, subordinate legislation. We have six negative incidents before us today. The first incident is National Health Service free prescriptions and charges for drugs and appliances, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 160. There is no motion to uh, annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Do any of the members have comment? In that case, is the committee agreed then to make no recommendations? Thank you. The second instrument is Certification of Death Scotland Act 2011, authorisation of Cremation, Death Out with Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-162. Uh, again, there has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn uh, the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. The details, of course, are in your papers. Uh, do any uh, of the members wish to make any comment? There is no comment, then can I put it to the committee that we agree to make no recommendation. That's agreed, thank you. The third instrument is Certification of Death Scotland Act 2011, Application for Review Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-163. There has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn uh, the attention of the Parliament to the instrument, the details, again, are in your papers. Um, is there any comment from members? There isn't. Is the, com uh, the committee then therefore agree to make no recommendation? Thank you. Thank you. The fourth instrument, Certification of Death Scotland Act 2011, Consequential Provisions Order 2015, SSI 2015-164, Again, there has been no motion to annul. The Dele Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. The details, again, are in your papers. Uh, is there any comment from committee members? There isn't. I therefore ask the committee to agree that we make no recommendation. That is agreed, then. Thank you. And the fifth instrument is Certification of Death Scotland Act 2011, Post-Mortem Examinations, Death Out with United Kingdom, Regulations, SSI 2015-165. There has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument. The details, again, are in the papers. Um, do I have any comment from committee members? I haven't. Um, is, uh, therefore, does the committee agree to make no recommendation? Thank you. The sixth and final instrument before us this morning is the Registration of Births, Deaths and Marriages, Scotland Act 1965, Prohibition of Disposal of a Body Without auth Authorisation, Regulations 2015, 20, um, SSI 2015 166. There has been no motion to annul. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the, inst the, to the instrument. The details, again, are in the papers. Um, do we have any comments from members? We have no comments. Has the committee therefore agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed. Thank you. We now move to agenda item number three. Uh, which uh, is our main business uh, uh, of today, two evidence sessions on Carers Scotland Bill, the second of which will be uh, by video conference. Uh, last week, uh, of course, we heard evidence that focused on adult carers, and today we will focus on young carers. Um, the 
the normal way we deal with this is to introduce ourselves and in, uh, you know in, in this uh, format my name is Duncan McNeil I'm uh, the MSP for Cleland and Inverclyde and the convener of the Health and Sport Committee Sarah. I'm Sarah Davis I'm the director of East Lothian Young Carers Bob Doris MSP for Glasgow and I'm deputy convener of the committee Mike McKenzie MSP Highlands and Islands Region uh, good morning, uh, uh, Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. I'm Margaret Murphy, I'm the Chief Exec of Edinburgh Young Carers Project. Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. I'm Louise Morgan, I'm the Coordinator for the Scottish Young Carers Services Alliance. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Lois Ratcliffe, Development Worker, Edinburgh Young Carers Project. Richard Lyle, Central Region, MSP. James Marshall, Development Manager at Stirling Carers Centre. Richard Simpson, uh, Mid Scotland and Fife MSP. Thank you all for your attendance this morning. Um, we'll go st uh, direct to questions. And the first question is Den Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you, convener. <clears throat> there is a perception that um, there are a great number of young carers uh, who haven't been identified that are actually providing care. And there's also the perception uh, among various groups that some of the young carers that are identified are given very little in the way of support. Do you think that this bill will help to identify additional um, carers who currently are unidentified? And do you think it will help with the level of support that carers actually need? Any volunteers to pick that one up? Please, Louise. Yeah. I know that um, within the government response to the consultation, um, they did say that there seemed to be plenty of measures within the bill which would help to identify young carers. Um, I do believe that having a piece of legislation such as the, the Carers' Bill and hopefully the, the Carers' Act, as it will become... Um, will help to promote general awareness of carers and young carers. I think one of our real concerns generally is the identification of young carers. That is one of the most substantial problems I think that we have in trying to um, overcome the difficulties of actually providing support to young carers. Mm -hmm. We can't support them unless we actually identify them. Um, so I think knowledge of the Carers' Bill, of the specific young carer statement as well, um, will help to promote the identification of young carers. Um, I know that the official government figure at the moment is 44,000 young carers in Scotland. Um, within the Alliance, we have upheld the, 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 the belief that the figure is much nearer 100,000 young carers, which has come out of survey work that we have done <coughs> in schools. But we are very happy to accept the new recognised figure, but that which government is promoting of 44,000, which is a significant increase on the 16,701, which was previously the figure, which was uh, universally accepted. So um, I, 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 I am content that the, the bill will help, or the Act, will help to promote the identification of young carers. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, Sarah. Um, we, we welcome it, the bill, and we do think it will improve identification of young carers. I suppose our concern is what will happen when they're identified and will they be offered a young carer statement or not? I mean, at the moment, they can have a young carer's assessment, but we find very few are done. It's almost impossible to get one, actually. You know, when you ask for one, people don't know what they are. So I suppose it's just, will young carers receive a young carers statement? That's our main concern. Okay. Anyone else? Dennis, you want to follow yeah, up? Thank you, uh, thank you for that. I am still, still would like to explore how do we um, a, identify some of our young carers that are providing care that we are missing at the moment. And, and I accept the government figure. Um, the, uh, but... There is this, I think, a perception that there probably are more young carers providing care. And it's how do we then um, try uh, and find out those young carers? Now, do we do it through uh, the named person? Do we do it through guidance teachers? How do, how do we do this? And do you think that 
the if we get the young if we can get a statement that's fine but we need to identify the key run in the first instance and i'm still a little bit um cautious about how we identify some of our young carers who are providing a, an extremely important role within a family uh, and sometimes that cares for siblings or parents or whatever but um they're going they're not being identified and if they are identified, do we have the appropriate resources to meet those specific needs? And I recognise that most of the submissions are saying we should have national guidelines as opposed to local guidelines. Um, maybe just your thoughts there. Margaret, and then I'll uh, put a couple of bits. Hi there. Uh, yeah, I think, we, I think we have to start where the, the young people are, and that's within the schools. So I think to, to raise awareness across all of the schools, and that could be young carer organisations going in or making the, the guidance staff, just making the, the, the head, head staff aware that, that there are young carers there and providing them with a bit of support as to how they can actually identify that. Because a lot of the young people and young carers, are not, nobody in the school knows that they are young carers because they may well not be having any additional support needs. They just might be getting on with it. So I think what a lot of the young carer organisations across Scotland are trying to do is to try and start where the young people are. So that's raising awareness to staff across the schools, but also doing, doing pupil awareness sessions as well because it's, it's a bit about taking the stigma away from, from young carers. So if they feel that they're they've got other pupils or their peers that are supportive to the needs of young carers and aware of what young carers actually do, then they're more likely to maybe put their hand up and, and say that, yeah, I am a young carer. With regards to that, I think what we've got to do is I don't believe that every young carer needs to have a specialist support service as in a, to go to a, a dedicated young carer agency. They can potentially <coughs> survive quite well. Uh, just having that acknowledgement that, that, that they are a young carer and they get a level of flexibility within the school. So that might be all they need. But I think the fact that they, you know, they have the opportunity to say I'm a young carer and get the additional support within the school that they need, then that's, th then that's what they're looking for. So I think you have to start at the school, but I think you also have to equip the school to be able to handle that as well. So if all these young carers are coming out and saying, I'm a young carer, how is the school going to deal with that? So that's about giving them a bit <laughs> of knowledge on how to identify them and, and a sort of easy support or flexible support that can, that can also help with that, but also give them the knowledge of what else is around about out there, like organisations like herself. And I think we also need to go and do a bit of work with the universal services, other youth projects, wherever young people actually go, there has to be a level of awareness within those projects as well about what a young carer is and how we can identify and support them. Louise? Yeah. Um, I totally agree with Mags. It's, we have to go where, where they are and uh, where we see projects working in schools and delivering awareness raising, then we know that um, the young carers in, in those schools certainly um, are receiving recognition of what they do and any support, ongoing support that, that they subsequently need. Um, what we do find is that where perhaps um, services, young carer services, uh, lose funding and they lose those workers to go into the schools, um, we do see a drop, if you like, in the amount of support that schools, which if, if you like, we would already class as in young carer aware, kind of drop their performance in terms of supporting young carers. So what I would say is that we need to uh, keep that momentum of presence in schools. We need to make young carer work workers available to young carers in schools. Uh, Mag's put forward the point that not necessarily all young carers want to go to a service, and that's definitely true. Um, they maybe don't have the time to go to a service. They may would they would may, maybe prefer to um, to go home and and uh, and have some time to themselves. Uh, but that's all about choice. But I think it's about equipping our school staff to know what to do when a young carer is identified. What are the other services they can maybe signpost them to? But what service, what kind of support can they also deliver within that school itself? Um, and where we see that done, it's normally done very well. Um, I know that Stirling has a, has a good model for that. I know that Edinburgh does as well. Um, but also, I think the point I would like to make is about GPs. Um, but if we want to explore the schools um, aspect of, of things first, then that's, that's fine. We can come back to to the, the, the part that GPs have to play in all this about identification. James, you want to come in? 
Yeah, it's just picking up on both uh, Louise and Margaret's points. Um, in terms of schools, I think Louise is totally right. We need to, to work closely with the schools to equip them to be able to support young carers within their daily lives. Um, we, as a service, have a, or as an organisation, have a specific dedicated young carers education worker. That's one post working with 47 schools within Stirling Council. Now, in order to work closely with those schools, what we do is we, um, we identify within each of the schools a schools young carers coordinator, almost a champion um, within that school, who will uh, be the link between ourselves and the school, um, between, sorry, link between ourselves and school for the young carers, um, so that they have a point of contact within their daily lives. As well, within the identification side of it, um, the awareness raising within the schools is crucial. We carry out a, a range of awareness raising activities, and what we do is we get the young people to fill in an evaluation form where they can self-identify at the bottom as a young carer. In terms of the early and preventative support, that's where we're finding um, that we're identifying young carers at the earliest possible opportunity. When we receive referrals from the likes of social services, it tends to be when the young person is at crisis point. So it's imperative that we work with, as, as Margaret rightly said, we work where young people are, um, and it's imperative that we work with schools in relation to the identification of young carers. Anyone else? Lois? Um, talking about identification and support, I think there's a middle step in there, which is the key to bridging that, that or giving the answer to the things, is the statement. So when the young person is identified, the statement or what used to be the assessment that goes through to understand the young carer's needs at that time is going to be the critical stage in making sure the, direct, the correct support that the young person wants is there for that young carer at that time. Um, and I think the identification, and I'm going to just come on from Louise's point there, schools, I think there's lots of great work happening out there that could be rolled out across and the sort of numbers and the, the numbers raising in Edinburgh certainly coming from the schools project that I know of is showing that. I do think that GPs, hospitals and condition-specific units is a key sort of target place to get those young carers directly linked in at an earliest possible stage, especially when the consultation looked at um, guidance through stages of caring. So when you look at some of the sort of terminal illnesses that young carers deal with, so you've got young carers on all different sort of spectrums of caring, and especially related to terminal illnesses, if we can get them referred or a sort of identification process in place to have them referred through these units where they're getting picked up by professionals and that will certainly help identify some young carers that I think make up perhaps a majority of the hidden young carers that we're not seeing at present in, in um, the services. Okay. Do you, do you want to... I'm just wondering, know? convener, is if, if the witnesses feel there's a, a role for using the social media um, in terms of the identification and again, for support in terms of peer support. So using, whether it be dedicated Facebook or some sort of notice board um, for young carers. Um, so if they're not wanting to go to maybe formal groups or carers forums, for instance, that they've maybe got the, uh, a social media network that they can use, would you support something like that? And is it available? What? Thanks again. Um, certainly coming from this, I work with young adult carers, 16 to 20 years old in our project, and certainly from that perspective, I do think there's a need for almost a virtual support in place. Sometimes I'm responding in emails to young carers out there in, the, in, in Edinburgh who just want that, I've got this issue with this, where can I go? So I do think a sort of modernised interactive service online that can give that direct instant support to young adult carers would really be, be vital. And I mean, these are young carers at crisis point that still won't want to come into the project, but do just want to have that email communication. So I definitely think there's, there's room and scope for that and it would definitely support young adult carers. And just following on from some of um, um, Dennis's questions, can we, can we have um, an idea of some of the uh, the good practice is actually taking place in terms of um, you know, some schools, some areas, but not others, and whatever I mean. I think sometimes the, the committee can be helpful in that if we identify some uh, practices, challenges, maybe some others who are, who, who have, who are not doing as much or whatever. But Louise, um, who, who, who I think mentioned the, the care aware uh, principle and uh, you know how that is uh, operating locally and, and, and I see James wanting in there as well. Louise, please. Uh, 
Yeah, I um, I, I would I would like to say that we probably have two examples um, of good practice in schools with us uh, this morning. Certainly, Sarah, I don't know so much about what you're doing in West Lothian, in East Lothian just now, but I know that Edinburgh and, and Stirling are, are shining examples of, uh, of, of what can happen in schools. I mean, um, I believe in, in, uh, in Stirling there's even, sorry, I'll, I don't want to take James's thunder here, he maybe wants to talk about it, but uh, they're, they're, they actually developed a, a young carer class um, as to be part of the, the curriculum in one, in one of the secondary schools. Um, certainly, I know Stirling of old, um, in terms of what the history is with the, with the development of that, and as, as I say, that did show for me that you have to keep that presence there or you lose it because you had every school on board at one point and then lost the worker and the whole thing went went to pot so i would say stirling edinburgh i could i could tell you i mean i, I could you know if i got a list in front of me i'll say yes that one that one that one for instance aberdeenshire um they appointed um or seconded a, 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 a secondary school guidance teacher uh, to the young carer service to develop resources that could be used throughout the, the, the uh, local authority area in the schools there. And I think, again, that was another model of, of yeah. what, a way to is do it, it actually taking somebody get, from Lee, education. Is, you know, is care aware, is it an accreditation, no. is it a badging that, no. uh, that, that schools in that area would get, or we, is it, a, is it a, we, an accreditation? No. Sorry, that, whenever, whenever I said you know, what we would call them care aware, we, what, what, uh, I think what we meant was informally we would know that we'd visited that school and that they'd already right. had training. Um, we don't yet have any kind of um, care aware um, a badging, if you like, or award, although that is something that Carers Trust is looking into in, in England at the moment um, and looking at different standards of carer, uh, young carer awareness within schools. Um, and that might be a route that, that people want to, to go down. But um, it, we, we, we have generally, I have, um, if you like, information about I know who works in schools and yes. where that has gone well so mm -hmm. if you would want to visit anything any service like that then get in touch and I can put you in touch with, with okay. who would be. James you wanted to be on this subject? Yeah I think I'll just pick up on two points there. We'll mention the good practice example that Louise mentioned there about the, uh, the young carers class um, I just want to start off by saying in relation to the carer aware I, I mentioned that we work with all the local authority schools um, and, and part of that is the school appoints a, um, a champion or school young carers coordinator. In addition, the school also signs up to a charter of action that has various areas that they agree um, in relation to supporting young carers and that charter is displayed within their um, reception areas for pupils, parents, general public to, to see. So it's not a badge as of such, but it's a recognition of the partnership between ourselves and their commitment to supporting young carers. Um, in relation to a good practice example, um, I just want to mention a, a high school within Stirling who um, identified a need within their school, identified that they had a high number of young carers and that the, 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 um, the caring roles having a detrimental impact on their school attendance, attainment, um, and therefore, due to this, they, they established themselves with support from ourselves as a, a, as a, a young carer service, a dedicated class. Now, that class um, is within the school curriculum. And it, the idea of it is it gives the young people um, peer support, but it's also building their skills, building their experience. They, for example, did a lot of uh, work around cooking. Um, a lot of the young carers, part of their caring responsibilities are um, the, main, um, the main cook for the household. So they, uh, they, they developed a lot of work around that. And as a, as a result of that, the outcomes for the young carers themselves were that we had increased attainment, increased attendance, and an increased enjoyment level um, in school. Um, and, and they felt more that the school was more aware of the caring role and that they could interact with the school at a higher level in relation to that. Okay. Lise, you want to come back on that? Um, yeah, in, I yeah, sorry. I, I really just wanted to say in terms of raising awareness as well um, that we had a national campaign a few years ago um, aimed at the younger young carer age group. Um, this group was highlighted um, at the Young Carers Festival in that most services were providing support to those young carers aged eight and over, but what was happening to the, the sort of, you know, un under eight year old? And how do we begin to recognise those young carers? How do we actually explain what being a young carer means? I mean, that is half the trouble. It's like, you, you're a young carer. Well, what, what, what does that mean? Yeah, I look after my goldfish. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult, I think, sometimes for 
very young children to comprehend what being a, a young carer means when it sometimes just means being part of a family. And uh, we had um, some money from Scottish Government to um, develop two national mascot figures, which we called Eric and Tracy. And uh, each service in Scotland had um, mascot figures, which they were invited to take out to primary schools to make it more of a kind of, you know, very young person friendly sort of um, project to try to raise awareness of, here's Eric, he, he's 10 years old, he looks after his brother, this is what he does, and here's Tracy, who is in a different caring role, looks after her mum, but she's only eight or whatever. So it was, you know, it was, it was very much aimed at the, at the younger children. Um, unfortunately, we only had about a year of funding to, to do that. So again, it was about trying to sustain something which could really have made a big difference. Um, Eric and Tracy are still talked about, but I think uh, we would probably like to maybe look at how we could uh, make a campaign like that work better. You know, that recognition about two mascot figures. I mean, I come from the age of the, the Tufty Club, and Tufty was synonymous with health, you know, with crossing the road and, 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 and road safety. So, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> shouldn't have said, maybe I shouldn't be at a young carers meeting. <laughs> But, um, you know, that whole value about having a figure that you see and you immediately think, young carer. Margaret. Yeah, I just want to kind of go on what James has said as well. I think the good practice is definitely having somebody identified within the school, young carers coordinator. So that's definitely something that's key. I think what's also key is providing some sort of toolkit, if you like, for the, for the schools and the staff within, within the schools to actually be able to either take some lessons and, and work with them with their, with their class. But I also think what, we've st what Edinburgh has started to do, and that's to, to go into primary schools more now, because it was, we, we are all across all the, the secondary schools, but what we're finding now is that we need to get into the, into the primary schools, and we've now developed a toolkit specifically for uh, primary school children and for the staff to be able to, because it's all around about more so play, and about how to identify what's happening in the household, their role within the household, what's their, their siblings doing, who do they care for. So we are, we are starting to explore that type of work, and, it's, and, and we're getting a lot of very, very, very little young carers, like age five, age six, actually being identified. And what we are doing is we're then bringing them, on, them onto our main programme, but we're also providing like after school clubs for them as well on a fortnightly basis so that we can start this socialisation and interaction with their peers and things like that and then trying to get the family a bit of support that's, that's required within there as well. So this is a bit like a, a sort of pilot if you like. So Edinburgh are more than happy to provide any sort of findings, uh, initial findings about how that's, how that's going for the committee in the future. Okay, Sarah, and then I think Rhoda's want a question. Um, we, we work with um, primary aged young carers and their families and what we try and do, and I think it's important talking about the high schools, is that when a child is moving into primary six, primary seven, is that we start looking at their transition to high school and making sure that the high school is aware that they're going to be a young carer and that the family's aware and that they've got homework support and that their reading and writing is up to the standard of going to high school because a lot of young carers seem to slip under the radar and it's only when they get to high school that they find that they've got problems you know with reading writing maths um, so i think transitioning to high school is a really important thing to be considered um, maybe in the young care statement that might be something to put in there rhoda can, can i ask a wee supplementary just on that before of course going you on can. to my own question because um, everyone's talking about education in school. There's young carers who are preschool. Um, Louise Morgan mentioned G the role of GPs, which kind of jumps out at me as being the one group of people who should be able to identify all carers because they know where. So I was wondering if Louise could maybe say something about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm afraid what I probably have to say isn't very positive. <laughs> um, we certainly, when we consult with young carers at our annual Young Carers Festival, and we do that yearly, um, we do ask about how much support are you getting from universal services such as education, health, and social services. Um, they feel they, they, the young carers have said year on year. Um, that GPs are very, very unlikely to be a source of uh, identification or, or support to them. Um, most of them say, my, my GP doesn't know that I'm a young carer. 
Um, I think certainly I was reading the, the guidance for the Children and uh, Young People Act, and uh, there was an example in there that GPs, when they do diagnose someone who, with a condition, then they should be asking about the children in that family and um, discussing with them what impact will this have on your children? Do you think, obviously, maybe nobody knows yet what the impact is going to be, but to begin that conversation and uh, recognise that there are potentially children and young people in that family who are going to become carers. Um, so I think if we are asking GPs to perform that duty, then we could hope to see a rise in identification of young carers. But how long will that take? Um, how, you know, the, the, the GPs maybe require the, the, the training around that to, to um, realise that they're not identifying children and young people. Um, certainly the Young Carer Authorisation Card, again, we're talking about an initiative which is within a health setting. Um, that is something which GPs could be identifying, where GPs could be identifying young carers and um, looking at the, the, um, them being issued with, with a, a Young Carer Authorisation Card. So there's a lot there that could be done from a health point of view. Well, I hope that yeah, I think that's a key, a key sort of stepping stone identifying young carers. I certainly know that in Edinburgh, I've got a great relationship with um, Craig Miller, a GP practice, and often I've sort of supported young people going along. It can be dependent on the individual GP that sort of is taking on that young person's case, as can be the case across lots of things in schools with teachers. Um, I do think there is a case for young people. Um, supporting someone with drug and alcohol issues. And I think that quite often young carers can be thought of as heroes. Um, but yet when it comes down to drug and alcohol issues, that sort of hero label kind of gets taken away and there's a stigma attached to it. And I think we certainly, Edinburgh Young Carers Project, was looking at the school's training, the CPD, um, Continual Professional Development Training that we're doing for teachers. Could that be modelled, which it could be modified and tweaked slightly, and be provided to GPs um, locally so that they've all got at least the knowledge and awareness. And also I noticed that there was comments about a carer's register that GPs would possibly keep if young carers sort of wanted to identify with that. And I think that's going to be a key piece of kind of identifying these hidden young carers. Thank you for that. Back to you, Rhoda, I think. Supplementary, Supplementary on, that. on that, but GPs. It, it's GP, well, it's the health services, right, really, okay. because you've mentioned GPs, but GPs' <laughs> traditional role is actually diagnosis and treatment and you know, they, although they have a holistic role for the patient, they don't have it for the, they don't often have it for the whole family, and they don't have any social work in the practice. No. Uh, but I wonder about a drug and alcohol group because I think that's a very big group, and uh, I just wonder about the, the connectivity to the drug and alcohol services, and whether in fact, you know, you, you you've considered additional training for them because they do tend to be more connected, certainly in Glasgow where they've got an integrated service, in West Lothian, where I worked, we had an integrated service. You know, what about training for them or identification from that end? Yeah, well, I, um, Max would probably speak better than me. When I, I've been off maternity leave for a year, um, but I know that certainly since I've came back, there was talk about doing work with GPs. Drug and alcohol, we've got two drug and alcohol workers in our project who work with the young carers, and certainly one of them has came from a drug and alcohol service. But I'll pass it over to Mags. If Mags knows, have we been, has there been any talk about that in the last year, Mags? Any talk. Or have we delivered any training to drug and alcohol services? Yeah, we're actually funded by the local drug and alcohol uh, project in Edinburgh Council. So we've got funding now for two drug and alcohol workers who are working specifically with young people who are caring for a, a, a parent with problematic uh, drug or alcohol use. What we have found over the, probably the last year, or we, we've, we've been doing this work for about six years, we've now got a bit of funding to allow us to extend that work and develop that work. And what we've found is, is probably about, definitely about a half of the young people that are coming through our doors now are affected by, are affected by caring for a parent with problematic drug or alcohol use. And I think this is, and because of the, what Lois had mentioned about the stigma attached, there has to be a, a slightly different approach taken for, for, those young, for, for those young carers. And that's about when we go into the school, yes, we do raise awareness that these are issues that young carers can deal with. But I think it's about the appropriate level of support that they require, because there's not this sort of hero, I'm a hero when I'm going home to care for mum. It's a bit about, oh, is your mum an alcoholic? Is she a drug addict? There's not that level of sympathy or acknowledgement of the 
the, the, the actual trauma, and that's that's the problem that we're finding with these young people. It's the trauma that they that they go through and the, the the experience, and nobody really really knows how this trauma actually comes out. It could be behavioural, it could be lots of different things, but I think we definitely need to be looking at how that type of caring uh, affects affects a young person because there is the the kind of no con the no con thing after it. And an example that I had for one of the young people that we were working with was mum was in recovery. And all, this, all the services and support services around about that, that family were happy because mum was doing a great job. She was in recovery. However, the young person, the young carer was very, very resentful because what they said was, mum, you have no idea, you can't remember the, the life I had for the last five years. Yeah, you're in recovery, but you didn't remember. You don't remember what I had to go through. So I think that's the type of trauma and stuff that we have to, we have to definitely concentrate on that. That, that, that kind of group of young people. Sarah. I agree with Max. We, we also work with our local um, drug and alcohol partnership and they're very traumatised, these children. And when their parents do get better, they do get angry. <laughs> um, it's like they can relax, isn't it? And, and, and they have a go at their parents. So then you've got to deal with that. But we, we do have a training programme that we have used with the, the organisations within our local drug and alcohol partnership. So if anybody wanted to... Yeah. But back to Richard's basic point, I mean, there, there will be a care plan, I think. Well, there used to be, there could be a, a care plan for the National Health Service and their services for those who are having pro problematic life, their addiction to drug or alcohol or whatever. There will be, but there will not be a care plan f for the carers, are there? The, the, you know, it doesn't... Not, not unless... You know, nothing... Has, you know, um, uh -huh. has been identified as having a care and role within that family. It would be unusual. Um, possibly if the, the young carer had been referred, if you like, almost informally to a young carer's support service, um, they would probably have some kind of um, support plan for within that service, uh -huh. but they may very well not be on the, the social work services just, just as um, a, books, yeah, if you yeah, like. As a, a casework yeah, sort of thing, yeah. and somebody took an interest in some of this mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. years ago, that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that there was that sort of gap that the, the social work services were to support the person with the addiction. Yeah. <coughs> the health service mm -hmm. would support the person or the GP, but there was no wider concept that there was a family that was, or, or, or carers. And I mean, I don't think that's changed over the years, has it? I, I, I really don't think so. I mean, no. certainly Saul Becker Research, who's the sort of main sort of um, research on, on young carers issues in, in the UK, um, he did find that where there was um, social work service input into a family, for instance, that the, um, the young carer was, sorry, the, the children, young people within that family were more right, likely to be recognised as young carers and therefore have some support put in and therefore suffered um, less um, or, or, or had, had better outcomes at school, etc., um, because they already yeah. had some kind of support there in the family. But, but, but unless was, that support uh, is actually already in and ident the, the young people are identified as carers, then there's not necessarily anything there for but, them. But that was, was, it, was that a concept? Was it reactive or was it planned and preventive? You, you, you know, in, in terms of casework sort of experience, it was <laughs> more reactive. It's when the, the house burnt down, they, they got the services rather than trying to manage. If they were managing and they were showing some resilience, they were allowed to go on with it. But if the house burnt down, I then there is, you know, yeah. it's just a lack of planning. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm just confirming it. I think it tends I, I to be think more crisis It hasn't changed over many years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Richard. Just one final point on this identification issue. The, uh, there is a committee sitting at the moment, there's a working group sitting at the moment called um, trying to develop a single shared assessment for drug and alcohol. It's called DAISY. Don't ask me why. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's, uh, it's working on it at the moment. And I just wonder whether included in that data collection system there is going to be identification of young carers. Because if there isn't, that will be a very serious omission. Not as far as I'm aware. Um, and I think, that would, I think you're quite right. I think identification... So I guess your initial question was, could training be delivered to drug and alcohol workers and drug and alcohol services? Yes, it could be done, and that could happen easily with, I guess, minimal funding because we have the training in place for teachers and that could be tailored relatively easily. As far as the working group, Daisy, I'm not even, a, like, I wouldn't be the person to answer that question, but I think you're quite right. I think it's quite a relevant point that 
there should be something in there around identifying the young carers within them families. I'm sure the committee can write to the ISD about this. Okay. I've, got, I've got another supplementary from, uh, from Nanette Millen, and then I'll get back to Rhoda, but you started all of this, Rhoda. It's a, it's, the it's panel working, the round table working, that's the discussion we're having here this morning. Very Nanette. Get a, I suppose following from, from, from Richard Simpson, say, I mean, is there, do we have any idea the sort of scale of the problem, what proportion of young carers, in fact, are affected by drug and alcohol abuse? Well, only in my project. Uh, I've seen an increase from a third to a half. So I don't know the, the, the kind of figures. I don't have those figures across, across the country or across a city. But I know that it's increased from a third to a half. Uh, mm -hmm. Louise? I would say from the, some of the, the, the surveys that we've done uh, with, throughout the, the Young Carer Services, it tends to be about a third. But again, there is the issue about not declaring that this is... The, one of the, 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 the central points of why they're, why they're caring in a family as well, that they're presenting to services as, I'm looking after my mum who has depression or, or some other, something else, but uh, the, the alcohol or, or substance misuse issue is, is left un, unsaid and maybe isn't uncovered until later do we get to know the family better. Okay. One, I'm going to... One of the issues that we need to be able to identify what caring role that uh, a young carer is is having uh, I, I would you know we're sort of drifting into the sort of drug and alcohol and that's that's very important because th there is a need there but it's a m multiple sort of complex area in terms of caring do we need to identify do we need a register in terms of the types of the caring role is it because uh, a mom's depressed or is it because they've got a sibling with uh, complex disabilities you know what are the reasons that they are caring in the first instance, and maybe that's the information we need to try and uh, um, identify. Okay, Rhoda. Thank you. Um, moving on a little to um, the support available to young carers, and the bill talks about stopping the young carers' role for a uh, preschool age young carers. Um, and while I think that's understandable, I wonder um, why that stops once a child goes to school, because they're still very young. Should we be looking at stopping the caring role for all children to allow them to, to learn and be educated, or is that just simply not feasible? Rose? Um, again, going to come back to sort of key research theory, so relating the theory to practice and then hopefully implementing into policy. Joe Aldridge is another sort of key theorist in young carers. I've been having email communication with her about a path we were developing for the service for young carers who come through our service. She would suggest that um, young carers, from her research, often want to exit the carer role when it becomes too burdensome, when it becomes long-term or disproportionate to their age and maturity level. In which case, I think that the support and the assess... I'm going to use the word assessment again, but whatever tools we're using to assess the caring that we do, we have to understand that is that caring disproportionate to their age, to the maturity level, and how much of that is it realistic they can take on without having a dampening, a hamper to their childhood? Because some of the caring roles that young carers do can actually make them feel closer, can have a real positive impact, can make them independent and sort of the ability to, to think outside of the box and be creative. However, I think part of it for sort of certainly young carers at school is looking at Exiting it, exiting it when it becomes too burdensome and having the right measures to address that and look at it individually. But I also think when you come to young adult carers, 16 to 20 years old, there's something about ensuring that caring is not the only or main outcome of living in families affected by parental illness or disability. Because quite often with young carers, they can be pushed into or feel the only career option available for them is to continue caring or to go into a caring role or career. And it's actually just trying to level the playing field so they have other options. And I think part of that is removing the majority of the caring responsibilities so that they can choose what works for them in a balanced lifestyle. Um, I think I've made that clear. I'm not over someone else. Anyone else? I'm going to move then to Bob Doris. Um, thanks, thanks. Can you uh, um, now, the list of interest about the types of service provision we'd like to put in place to support young carers. I apologise for making it much more dry in looking at the bill and the specifics of the bill because that, I feel like that's the kind of framework behind which we use to support all that. I take on board quite well about it's about how you identify young carers and. 
the health service and GPs was mentioned, schools was mentioned, the Walsh Scott, for example, um, wonderful uh, youth group providers across Scotland who young people might open up to and reveal their caring role to. So I, I think it's a cross-society responsibility we've got, but it's the structure you then feed into once that's identified. Um, so I was just kind of wondering in terms of when we have a, a young care statement and assuming we get that, that structure right and you feed in, we also have an existence under the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 um, the, the obligation uh, to produce a, child, a child's plan uh, when there's a need for targeted intervention for well-being needs to be met. And I'm just wondering if the bill is clear enough as to when you provide a young carer statement and then you seek to provide services, whether of a general nature or a specific nature, and when that snowballs into the provisions that exist in the new Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 to provide a, a child's plan. I'm a little bit confused myself looking at it, but the bill's got to get the infrastructure right, whether on the face of the bill or in guidance. So this is the dry part of, 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 of the, the morning's evidence session, and the key thing is service provision. But we have to get the structures right to channel young people as individuals through that structure to get the service provision. So how would you see the young carer statement working and how would that interact with the, 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 the child's plan and obligations under the 2014 Act? James? I think uh, it's important to start by saying for a lot of young carers, um, their caring role and the impact of this might be their only specific well-being need. Um, and therefore, it's important that they have something that's tailored for them as a young carer. Um, in answer to your question, I think the young carer statement must interlink and fit in really well with the current GERFEC assessment process and also the, uh, the subsequent child's plan. Um, however, as I've said, we do agree that, that not all young carers have additional well-being needs um, but that requires a child's plan. But where there is a child's plan in place, um, it's important the young carer statement is in, developed in addition to this. Um, so that there's a document with a specific focus on the young carer's needs as a carer. I think as well, um, just as we're talking about the young carer's statement, I think in addition to this, um, what we feel should be included in the young carer's statement itself is anticipatory and future planning to be in incorporated or emergency planning to be incorporated within this. Um, I'll just give an example. We, we often know that uh, caring can be a barrier to young carers' future educational or employment aspirations. Um, and in order to ensure that we have the relevant support and services in place um, to alleviate these barriers, um, the young, to, to ensure that young carer can reach their full potential, we need to be looking at that, that future planning um, of the emergency and anticipatory nature. Thanks, James. Any other responses to Bob's question? Adding to James's. Louise? When I read about the provision of a, a young carer's statement, we certainly welcomed that. It sounded to us like what young carers had said in the consultation had certainly been listened to and, and acted upon. Um, it was something that young carers themselves asked for. Um, they quite um, distinctly said that a child's plan wasn't necessarily for them. Uh, I think one of the, the objections to it actually being the language of the child's plan when some of them felt um, much more responsible than, than a child might, might actually be. However, um, I think my, my interpretation of it would be that, for instance, with the, the, the national strategy for young carers, um, which has run from 10, 2010 to 2015, has said that all secondary schools must record young carers on their, their, their database. And I would be expecting that young carers who were recorded on a database in a school would then be entitled to have a young carer statement. For many of them, that would be very light touch. It would almost be a recognition that they had a caring role. What I think, you know, where... Uh, what, it's kind of like there's... about the anticipatory planning. It's about when that caring role, which is maybe OK at the moment, when that becomes um, more burdensome, um, having more of a negative impact on the young carer's life, then that young carer has more of a fast track, if you like, back to support and services being brought in or services being um, available to them. So I would see it, they're certainly not um, exclusive to each other. I could certainly see that um, a young carer statement could be very, very helpful to a young carer um, where there was maybe the need for the full-blown child's plan, but 
you could maybe be on a kind of almost a waiting list or a, a warning list almost um, should should that be uh, necessary for you and be brought in to help you Margaret? I think I think within the, the bill, though, it's, we do need a bit of clarity around about how it's, how it's actually going to link, how the Young Carers scheme is going to link with the CHELS plan, eh, because I, don't th I think we can all see this is the way it should sh happen, but I don't think the, there's the level of clarity there required to give the guidance to make sure that it actually happens. Thanks. Any others? No. Bob? That, that, that's really helpful. I mean, it's encouraging that, that you see it, it can dovetail and fit together very well, but a bit of clarity would be welcome, and that's helpful. Another thing uh, uh, in reading of the bill, um, there's a thing about reviewing a, a young carer statement and a young carer's plan. Now, I'm, I'm guessing this, but I suspect it's true that a young person may uh, not wish a young carer statement or a young carer's plan. They, they might not want to open up about the caring role they have, this, that and other. I'm just wondering, given the fact that if someone says, yes, give me a young carer statement, a young carer's plan, it would be reviewed. Should the provisions be in place where a young person says, no, I don't want one to go back in three months or six months or nine months and one year and re-offer it, rather than the, the statutory body, which would be the local authority, ticking a box and saying, you know, young person A was offered this, they refused it statutory obligation done? Should there be something about having to go back to the young person, you know, as they grow and get more mature or get more, more significant problems or get more comfortable in acknowledging the, the young carer's role they have? And I, I, I think Mr Ratcliffe mentioned that depending on the type of caring role they have, they may feel stigmatised in that caring role. And there's a variety of factors there. So I wasn't sure whether in the bill I spotted something to say you should go back to the young carer if they don't accept one. I'm just wondering if you think there should be something along those lines in the bill. Rose? It's, it's a risky one. Risky. Um, it's, it's a complicated one because if young people are given the sort of um, respect to say that, no, we don't want one, as long as they've had the full understanding, the stigma is removed, going back in three months or so might be a bit patronising. However, I do think one of the things that would help with the Young Care Statement, and it's an agreeing, agreement with um, James, is about this emergency planning. I think this is going to be a key part of the the immediate support that young person can have from a carer statement. So if carer statements are happening, if someone's responsible for them, and we currently know that the carer's assessments happen ad hoc, I've put in numerous requests and there's no timeline to it, um, I think that at the statement stage, if an emergency plan could be gone through really quickly so as, as part of the statement, so that they have something initially from that statement to, to work with in case of emergency, or making them clear that if they want a review or if they change their mind. So I guess what I'm saying is the statement could be offered, young people could take the statement, and then part of that statement is giving them an emergency plan. The second situation could be the statement's offered, the young person doesn't want the statement. However, an emergency plan could then be offered as well, just as a matter of course, because the emergency plan could say, if you change your mind or if you are in a need, or the caring situation changed, you can then contact and have a statement. So giving them the option and ability to request the review instead of putting the onus on social services in three months, because I worry that that could be more damaging. I don't know. I don't, what, I don't know what other people's views are on that. Can I just add a little yeah. Forget about the three-month figure. I'm just wondering whether there should be a, a follow-up trigger somewhere down yeah. the line. Yeah. yeah. I'm not. I'm not wed to three months or one year or two years. Just, I'm just asking, floating the question whether there should be a review at some point. That's yeah. No, no, I understand. What, I completely understand yeah. that. I just part of me thinks that if we can empower the young person to request that, but I understand that's complex. Um, I know Louise is kind of looking at me. Louise right? and then James, <laughs> I think. No, I was, I was really just going to agree with you, Lois, and, and sort of say, you know, that I agree with you that that would be complex. But it's maybe about when you make the original offer to make it clear to the young person that the offer maybe remains open. Um, I don't know how practical <laughs> that would be for, for local authorities, but I mean, in, in terms of looking at some kind of trigger as well to review the, the circumstances, um, if you do that on a kind of timeline basis, that's, I think that's quite dangerous because you could miss sort of critical life events in the family or whatever. So I'm not quite sure how you do it, but I think it would be great that young people could come back and say, actually, I would really like to take up that offer now. Um, 
-hmm. James, you have got the final word on that. Yeah, I think agreeing with Louise, I don't quite know how you would do it, but I think we're a big believer in empowering young carers and empowering them to the choice and, 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 and the right to ask for that, that inevitably young carer statement. I think in terms of the actual review of the, the statement itself, in the bill it states that the, uh, the statement will uh, look at whether the support provided in the first place um, is, is, has, has resulted in positive, out, uh, posit yeah, positive outcomes for the young carer. I think as well, we talk about a caring journey and we acknowledge that the young carers caring role goes up and down, the level of caring, the impact that has on them. I think that, the, that any review should also be looking at that as well, looking at whether their needs have changed, um, not just whether they've, they've obtained personal outcomes from the support received, whether they need additional support or whether that support needs to be detailed to meet, um, to meet their, their needs at that time. Okay. Richard Simpson. I wanted to take up the issue of the emergency planning because that's something which I feel very strongly about. In fact, meeting carers before the last election, that was the main thing they were concerned about. And indeed, the First Minister at the time did say that everybody would have an emergency plan. Um, and I just wonder whether that should be specified almost separately. I mean, when someone accepts the need for an assessment and accedes to that request, uh, you know, that then it obviously would be included in it. But it may be that people would accept that even if there isn't a full assessment and full support, that an emergency plan should be put in place, and that could be separate and almost, you know, then allow people to go back in. Because I think that's that's I think my personal experience that's a fear that carers have that they, they often deny the need for support, feel they're coping well, but they have a worry in the back of their mind: what happens if? Sarah. Um, we do a young carers assessment, just our own young carers assessment with the young carers who we work with and we ask them what do you do in an emergency and it's become clear that you sort of need two emergency plans. You need an emergency plan if the carer goes into hospital or is unable to care due to illness but with children, especially ones living in a single parent family, you actually need an emergency plan for if the person that the young person is caring for goes into hospital and then the child has no one to look after them. And I think that's really important. So we sort of have two emergency plans in, in our assessments. Yeah. Anyone else in response to Richard's words? Um, and I think that's a key point. And I think that the assess we have an assessment, we do a thing called a footprint, which is the idea of the assess the young person's journey throughout the service. This gets reviewed every six months while the young person's with the service. And I certainly think that we have emergency. We don't have such something called an emergency plan, but we definitely give young people support numbers. But I think an emergency plan in relation to caring role and how to, I think it would support the young carer moving away from the caring responsibilities and services with the knowledge that they could access it again if needs be. Because as James said, the caring role does dip, ebb and flow and dips ups and downs. And what we find sometimes with young people is we don't want them to, to become too dependent on the service. Whereas actually some young carers could quite happily live without our services, but they're worried about access again. So part of that is incorporating an emergency plan saying you can't just call up and be re-referred. And I think that would support carers actually feeling confident to go on without services. I think if I'm making sense there, it makes them feel less reliant on the service because they know they can access it, which I think is a big fear because sometimes they struggle to get the support in the first place. Okay. Um, I'm going to offer the opportunity for those members who hadn't had the opportunity to ask a question at this point. Annette? Yes, it, I noticed some of the concerns expressed about the, the young carer statement having a copy having to go to the named person. Um, might you make any comment on that? Do you think that should stand? Should that be changed? Or what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? Sarah? Um, we're quite concerned about that. Uh, we think it might put young carers off. I think it will depend on the relationship they have with the named person. And since the named person is going to be involved with the child's plan, you don't know what might be going on with that. It's also, we work very closely with families. We, we have a holistic approach. I think it's very important to work with the whole family. And, <laughs> I mean, the, you, your child would have a young carer's, uh, well, young carer's statement. It would be sent to the named person, but the parent wouldn't know. And then the gatekeeper of the information is the young carer. It's the young carer who decides whether the parent sees it. And I think that's far too much pressure on the young person, and it just might cause problems within the family. It might put the young carer off asking for a young carer statement. I know I can understand why it's in there, 
that maybe the, the young carer doesn't want the parent to see the, uh, the statement. I just wonder if there's some way around it. We do young carers assessments. We don't necessarily show the parent. We're led by the young carer. But we have a family discussion around everything, and so everybody feels included. And I'm just, I think that just it seems very bold that you know, it's going to the name person and that's it. it just that's why. Some more comment on that? Anyone else? Everyone agree with Sarah? agree with it and when we had the meeting with the Alliance there was lots of young carer projects around about that and we sort of raised the same concern mm. that it was a it could be a catch-22 situation uh, if you share this information with the, with the named person if the young carer does not want uh, the school knowing about their caring about their caring situation or did not have a positive relationship with the named person so it's just more or less backing up what, what Sarah's saying and I think a few of the, the young carer projects around about the table uh, were, were kind of worried about that as well Please. Yeah, just to say, we have highlighted that within our, our written response to you, and uh, it was certainly a, a worry of uh, many of the young carer projects who were who were there at, at the consultation. Um, I think th th there was sort of various um, opinions offered that maybe the young carers themselves should be should uh, be, be the, 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 the gatekeeper, <coughs> if you like, of whether or not the the, the, the statement was made known to the, the, the named person or not. Um, people thought that in terms of empowering the young people that, that that should be the case, but it could very well be the case that maybe the, the young carer was too young to make that kind of, of decision without realising what kind of impact it may have on the, on the family. So um, I think it's something that maybe needs further consultation with young people. Um, I'm really not sure because in terms of consultation with young carers, if you like, this aspect of the bill hasn't really been... Um, put to them for, for consultation. Okay. James? I agree with Louise. I think that, that there needs to be more consultation around this with young carers themselves. We have found very much the opposite within Stirling. Um, when we do an assessment, we will complete a single agency ch child's plan based on the support that is then going to be offered to that young carer um, with the young person's consent. And I think that is the key point here, with the young person's consent, and it is explained to them, that is sent to their named person and also to and discussed with their family, so that it all everyone around that child is, is, is clear and, um, and aware of the support that's going to be offered. But I think the key and crucial point there is that it's discussed and it's with the young person's consent. Okay. I've got a couple, a couple of supplementaries in this, Rhoda Grant and uh, Dennis Robertson. And, we're, and just remind people we're in the last 10 minutes of this session. I can understand what people are saying because of the detail that might be in the statement. But surely if a named person, especially when a child is in school, which is normally the head teacher, should be made aware that that child does have a caring role because a lot of what young people tell me is that the school is unaware, they expect them to have homework in on time, they expect them to turn up on time, they expect them to be turned out the same as everybody else. So at the very least, surely the school should be informed this person is a young carer and you need to make exceptions and um, allow them to, to carry out that role and, and support them in it. Maybe not knowing the detail of what's going on at home or indeed the support the child's getting, but surely they need to know that. Yeah, I'm, going, I'm going to take the two supplementaries, if that's, if that's all right, and, uh, and allow the, 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 the panel to respond. Dennis? It's still on the same theme, and I agree entirely with what Rhoda is saying there. But it, it, and just go back to James's point. Um, is it a question of trying to ensure that we provide the most appropriate information and understanding to our young carers so name person doesn't become a threat to them, as it shouldn't be? It's there um, uh, as... You know, it's an, an enabler. It's an empowerment. It, it's there to support. I think, as Margaret said earlier, you know, we've got we've got toolkits. You know, maybe the name person's part of that toolkit. James, you want to respond, and I'll take others from the panel. I think just picking up on, on, on Rhoda's point, um, it was actually a head teacher. The reason we we've developed that process in sending the, the information to the schools um, was it was actually a head teacher who contacted us and identified that um, she was unaware of the number of young carers in her school. As an organisation, we were supporting young people out with school, but she was saying that, that, that she was wanting to be aware of how many were within our school so she could provide appropriate support on a, on a daily basis. Um, so that, that very much 
led to us sending the, the, the plans on, and we have seen a positive response to that. I think again, it comes down to um, like like the point that was made there, working with the named person and equipping the named person in relation to uh, raising awareness of young carers and young carers' issues. But also, as I sort of said before, um, working with the young carers so they're aware of, of of the role of the named person and the linkage there as well. Anyone else? Do you want to... Yes, please. Sarah, do you want to come back? Just to say, um, I, I, I kind of think I'm sitting here, you know, with, with kind of two hats on, maybe hearing from all the young care services in, in Scotland, or, or a majority of them. Um, I think that there is a bit of a divide sometimes, you know, about and that your point, Rhoda, certainly we would be saying to our services, I'm sure, would be encouraging young carers to make their school aware that they were a young carer um, because of the support that could be made available to them. Um, but we still have some young carers who say, I wouldn't want them to know. You know, uh, th th this, this is about our family business and I really don't want them to know. So I think, you know, you've got the kind of pushes and pulls of, of what, what's wanted. But then there's the, that thing about responsibility, um, about if people know then that you are a young carer. Um, that's not necessarily going to be publicised, but we could, you know, we, we can take responsibility for, you know, for... for um, looking at what happens when, when things don't, don't go so well for you. So I can see the, the kind of tensions here within, within this one. And I think, a dif I think another difficult point is that, if you like, the name person isn't really... In, I, I know that it's been working in Highland for, for some time, but nationwide we haven't really seen it in practice. And I think and also this uh, young carer statement is, is a new idea. So I think in terms of how that is going to work... Um, it's, it's, it might be difficult to, to predict, and how often will this circumstance actually arise that the young carer doesn't want the name person to know? So, I think there's still a lot of kind of. I, I'm really not quite sure. I, I, um, I think it would be beneficial for the teachers, high the high school head teacher, to know that a young person is a young carer, and we would certainly encourage a young carer to, to let us tell them or or, or let the let them let them know in some way one thing about the just the name person and the young carer initially getting the the a copy of the young carer statement is that a lot of parents feel very bad that the their young the child is a young carer and if they're sort of kept out of the loop in that way i think that's just going to make them feel marginalized and you know a lot of people mental health problems and stuff it's just going to make them feel that they're not worthwhile and I mean, also, and it could be that the, the, the child isn't caring for the parent. It could be that they're caring for a sibling. And I just think just it, it just needs to be looked at a bit to work out how you can do this in the best way for the young carer, the family, the school, and just so that everybody can be happy and all working together and not feeling that they're being left out in any way. Was yeah, I think it needs to not come down to. A duty. I think empowerment of the young carer would get the best possible results, and it's. I think it'll come down to professional practice. Because I think often, within a child protection case, for example, if a young person came to you and there's a child protection issue, you would inform the young person of the people you have to tell in the family. But part of that process is letting the young person understand why you're doing it, what's the result of that, and I think the difference with this is that there should be a choice for the young person to say no, but you'd rely on the professional practice and the professional doing the carer's statement to support that young person to understand that it should be a positive thing that's happening. So I would say that the, within the bill, it's possibly not a duty, but encouraged that the young person should, or the information should be shared with the lead person if that's not the lead person. However, it should be the young person's choice, but foreseeing it in their best interest. Because I do think it's professional... It's the professional delivering that, but it should always be the young person's choice, unless if it does get shared without the young person's consent, the concern then is that the young person disengages and then has no trust, and then that relationship's broken down with the support services. Um, and I think that's, that's the risk you run with making it kind of mandatory. And I think that with young people and adults, that would be the case there. But I do think you're right. I think it is sharing the knowledge and the awareness would only help, but... I don't think it can be mandatory. Good question, Annette, and a good discussion that came from that. So, you know, the committee can take some of that into their considerations. Uh, are, are there any other questions from any committee members who have not spoken? Uh, um, are there any additional questions from members 
at this point. There isn't. Can I thank you then on behalf of the committee for your attendance and participation this morning. All your written evidence that you provided, which will be important to us um, you know, in the progress of this bill. And we look forward to working with you uh, through the progress of this bill. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for your attendance this morning. I uh, was suspended at this point to change round. And thanks. Thanks, Sarah.
Um, Mike, I've got a little bit I have to go through first, but, but thank you. Um, uh, may I resume uh, the meeting? The observant among you will have noticed that our convener has left today's meeting, and I will therefore be convening the remainder of the meeting. So I am not Duncan McNeil, I think is the point I'm, I'm trying to, to make here. So we move to agenda item four, which is the second of today's evidence sessions in the Care of Scotland Bill, and this will be a by video conference, and may I request that members avoid interrupting the witness and each other and to speak clearly when answering questions. Can I therefore uh, formally welcome Marjorie Jagger, Manager Sky and Local Young Carers. Welcome, Marjorie. Thank you very much. Good uh, to be here. Okay, and it, it's a pleasure to have you, and for once the technology is working, we, we like this. Um, and we're going to go straight to questions, and <coughs> as previously agreed, uh, we'll take our first question from Mike McKenzie. Mike. Uh, thank you, Convener. What I wondered uh, if Marjorie could perhaps outline for the committee any special challenges that she uh, uh, feels are uh, presented to young carers um, by virtue of the fact uh, that she operates in the, in the Highlands and Islands and in a predominantly rural area. And so just in general terms, any special challenges and secondly, any implications that the bill has for cure, uh, young carers in a rural area? Thank you. I think the impact of rurality, the geography, you know, for a respite break, our young carers from going to Inverness, which is the nearest city, you're talking about a six hour travel journey there and back. So, you know, respite can just be for about three, four hours in a day, although it's fast as a day trip. The biggest concern we have there is the cost of the transport and how that affects our service delivery because it, it does reduce our ability to deliver more flexible service because respite is probably the key thing that young carers see it makes a real difference to them, particularly respite within their own peer grouping. A lot of young carers have said in the past that they don't access funds so much for their individual needs because they feel quite isolated going away for a break. They would rather have the support of other young carers so they can support each other and learn from each other and be with trusted adults. So we have the additional cost of taking groups away as opposed to supporting young carers just to access funding for going away. Thank the you. other kind of issues yeah the other kind of issues we have in Sky La Harsh particularly that affect more is maybe the confidentiality. You know, in small communities, you know, people tend to be very interested in other people's business. So the issue of confidentiality is you know, really a priority for young carers and who that lead person is in their lives and the trust that they have in them. So it can take a long time to build that trusting relationship with the family as well as the young carer themselves. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for that. Any, any else on that, Mike? Are you, are you finished? No, I'm content with that. Convener. Okay. Um, now, only because he caught my eye first, I'll take Dennis Roberts and then I'll take Rhoda Grant after that, Rhoda. <coughs> uh, good morning, Marjorie. Um, just to follow on from Mike, and, and I, I hope that it actually um, pertains to both rural and urban settings. With regard to a young carer maybe taking part in just local activities, you know, being a young person just growing up, in a, whether it be a small community or urban, maybe wishes to go to scouts, guides, play football, go to youth groups, that sort of thing. Do you feel that there's a role to offer support, even on a temporary basis, to enable young carers to go and just be young children and enjoy the other activities that other young children and young people enjoy? Yes, we certainly promote that, although we do find the barrier for a significant number of young carers that they feel that they underachieve in those activities because they maybe aren't able to commit to that regular attendance, to maybe you know achieve their badges to the same level at the same speed as their peers and quite often they can feel a bit overwhelmed by that and disengage from the activities and then that's when we find you know that they engage more and come back to us to say they want young carer services 
to deliver the service where they don't feel that level of underachievement in their local community. Do you think that the bill in itself um, could be improved to enable that to happen? You know, how do we empower those young people to live uh, those lives that maybe other children and young people live within their communities? What would you see that we need to do within the bill to make that happen? I'm not sure whether it can be made within this bill, but the one thing that young carers consistently tell us is that they feel and they are made to feel that they are underachieving. They believe that through maybe being a protected characteristic in equality law, that that would allow them to have like positive discrimination so that then they wouldn't be feeling they've got to measure up against peers who they feel are at a much higher attainment level than they are. And they would feel that that support would be more empathetic to their needs. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Dennis. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Hi, Marjorie. Um, can I just quickly refer back to an answer you gave earlier about a lack of privacy, lack of confidentiality in a rural area? Does that make it easier to, to identify young carers, given that you know, people in schools, people in support groups like yourselves, um, people dealing with young people would almost know someone's family circumstances and be able to identify them? Yeah. In some certain smaller schools, certainly, I think they are more aware more quickly. We find that most referrals actually come through families themselves because of the community network. We find these families are in the same clinics together, attending similar appointments, and they talk together and then share about perhaps the young carer service. Our other big referrers are actually young carers themselves who will share the information to their peers and so they will recognise other young carers probably more quickly than any professional will. And they are very good at supporting and advocating for a young carer and taking them along to find out more information or taking them to their guidance teacher and acting as a support, peer support that way. Okay. And we do find that that is probably the most effective way because we find that then they don't feel that the service has been pressured onto them. They are actually coming towards us for that service. So they engage and trust, build trust with us very quickly. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Can I ask about um, the bill and um, the role of preschool carers where it says that the, there should be a duty to stop the caring role for preschool carers. Do you think that should be the case for children in school or indeed is it feasible to stop altogether the caring role of preschool children? Yeah. I honestly don't believe it is feasible to stop that role at all and I think we run the risk of them becoming then hidden young carers rather than coming forward for support because you will find these preschool young carers can quite often become the pictures and carriers, perhaps for people with disability, maybe in wheelchairs, and then, or they can be the emotional supports for adults with mental ill health. And it's very difficult to measure, you know, that level of support, but it has got an impact. And for these young carers, they will do that naturally. They've grown almost into that role, and they would see that as part of their natural family dynamics that they would provide that support. If they felt they were going to be judged on that, then I think that's when you're more likely at a very early stage to start shutting down youngsters coming for support and the families accessing the support. I think it's more important to have recognition that that role is there and developing and likely to develop further as they mature. And so the early intervention work, I would say, would be more beneficial to the young carer and their families. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other um, MSPs? Uh, Nanette Millen. Hello. Um, th there were some concerns expressed in our previous session uh, about um, a young carer's statement, a, a copy of that having to go to the named person. Is that a particular problem? You, you've spoken about confidentiality and so on. Is, do you see that as a particular problem in, in your part of the world? No, I wouldn't say we've been in operation now for 15 years 
And in that 15 years, we've never had a young carer or family decline permission for us to inform the schools that this is a young carer in the family. And I think the key to that is that the family and the young carer both see benefit associated to that. And I think as long as that benefit is promoted and is realistic, then they will see that actually, yeah, it's in their benefit and best interest to do that. And families will look at the best interest of the young carer. So for going to the named person, I think the other issue is how much information is disclosed. If you're looking at impact of the caring role in young carer, I think the young carer and the family would be much more comfortable with that rather than disclosing you know, how many hours they perceive they're caring for in a day or a week and what particular tasks they're doing. They would see that perhaps as an invasion of privacy, but they would be able to recognise the impact and with guidance, I think most professionals would recognise the impact of the caring role. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, can, can I perhaps ask you, uh, Marjorie, uh, a similar question that, that, that we asked previous um, witnesses given evidence, and that is, can you maybe give some examples of good practice or, or best practice in your area where service and support for young carers exists? Because obviously the, there's a structure behind this bill, but the, the policy intent is to improve uh, the position and support for young carers uh, across Scotland. So can you maybe point to some, some, some good examples of something that, that does happen that you could put on the record here this morning? Okay. Yeah, certainly in regard to working with you know, GPs, then we set up a few years ago a flagging system with agreement with the GPs because, again, there's a confidentiality issues that GPs were wary of. You know, and identifying young carers, how they would approach that with families. So what we did was with our young carers that we had on our membership was share with them the benefits of the practices knowing that they were a young carer and we now get families, the parents and young carers to, to give signed consent for their notes to be flagged within the GP practices. So it doesn't matter which GP or which clinic they're appearing, in their notes there's an automatic flagging that there's a young carer who could benefit from perhaps additional time or additional you know, explanation that might be more around the caring issues in their lives as opposed to just looking at how they present with physical symptoms. I, I think that's an excellent example and it was something that was, was raised about in, improving that partnership with GPs and indeed the oh. wider NHS and the in, in the earlier session, I'm just wondering, one of the things that was also raised in the earlier session was the benefit of peer support for young care or something that perhaps I think you said initially can be more challenging given the distances involved to get that people around the, the, the same table to do that peer, peer support. I'm just wondering in terms of what we're doing just now and the technology just now, uh, the IT technology, social media and multimedia platforms, have you had any opportunity to roll out some service and support in relation to that? Or do you think that's an area that maybe needs more, more work and more progress? The young carers themselves say from all the years that we've been monitoring this that face-to-face -face contact is what has the biggest influence in their lives. And getting guidance and support from face-to-face -face contact and information as well is what works best for them because then they can inter enter into discussion, they know where that discussion is going to be held and action plans can be developed from that. Social media, we've actually developed more concerns rather than, you know, rather than, I suppose, seeing the opportunities there because we're seeing a number of our young carers being targeted online inappropriately and some of these young carers are very vulnerable and virtual relationships can seem very appealing because they can maintain them just within their household. What we try to promote with them is that they connect with people they know and they can trust because, because unfortunately, we have had predators targeting young carers. Marjorie, thank you for putting that on the record. I think that's good to give a balance to the, the opportunities around social media, but obviously not, a, not, not at the expense of quality face-to-face -face contact and you've highlighted some of the dangers so thank you for putting that on the record though Dennis Robertson wants to follow up on some of that. Uh, if I may convener uh, Marjorie um, again acknowledging that connectivity can be a problem sometimes in some of our more remote mm. and rural areas 
Um, face to face, would you acknowledge that face to face using technology like Skype, for instance, is useful in terms of we have uh, a distance or the cost of travel that that can be a barrier? that if we have the technology and obviously the, uh, if the equipment is available, that face-to-face -face could be through, a, for instance, using something like Skype? I would see that as being more useful as a stepping stone towards the ultimate of face-to-face -face regular contact with those young carers because, again, it's limited ability to really get to know that young carer what we do is observational work with our young carers so we can see and recognise when pressure is starting to build up on them, when anxiety is increasing. These things you don't tend to see over a presentation, over virtual you know, communications with them. And we also, respite breaks for us and young carers aren't all about just having a break, having fun. That's an element of it, but it's also about observing you know their personal safety levels you know their risk-taking behaviors and their peer integration levels and so we can develop then action plans based on by working with the young carer and we then have the evidence to support them to encourage them to actually engage in that action plan and see the benefit for themselves and motivate them to achieve you know their potential I acknowledge, I acknowledge what you're saying, eh, Marjorie, and I accept the fact in terms of social media there could be predators uh, for some of our more vulnerable. But we can set up private pages um, to enable like peer-to-peer -peer support uh, on a private page. Do you think that that in itself can be useful just as a support? I think, as I said, maybe a stepping stone support to you know, fuller support for them. And it may be for some young carers, particularly those that maybe, you know, don't need the specialist service support, then absolutely it should be explored and seen, you know, if that is of benefit to them. For a lot of young carers in rural areas, as you say, the connectivity is an issue. Uh, and that. quite a lot of them actually don't have coverage in their areas. And a lot of young carers in our area don't have landlines because of the cost of the lines. Mm -hmm. So they will have mobile phones that really they just use in emergency circumstances and unless they're in an area, which is usually the central areas, unfortunately, where they do have that connectivity. Yeah, and I accept all those points. And I think it's something that, you know, we need to try and improve on to, again, ensure that connectivity is there as a lifeline for, for people. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Yeah. Um, uh, th th thank you, Dennis. Marjorie, can I just put on record um, that I think you've made an, an excellent point in getting the balance right with, with technology because I'm, I'm a city MSP for Glasgow and if young carers in Glasgow are able to get that face-to-face -face meeting, I would completely understand why in terms of equality of service, you're keen to make sure that in your part of the world they can get that as well. So I think you're absolutely right to, to be persistent in relation to that. I obviously see opportunities for technology, but it shouldn't displace that equality of of service that I, I, I appreciate you're, you're seeking to, to have. Can, can I maybe move on and ask a, a, another question now, just in terms of uh, how, how the bill seeks to handle the transition from uh, young carers uh, to, to adult carers and the kind of support around that. So the bill sets out that a young carer statement would remain in place until after a person's 18th birthday un until such time as an adult carer support plan is put in place. I'm, I'm just interested to know whether you think that's an important part of the bill. And it is, of course, an opportunity for you maybe to make some more specific comments on how you feel in your part of the country that transitions are handled just now. Yeah, certainly. I think the, carer, you know, the young carer support statement is a really positive move because child's plans at present you know, are targeted towards the top end of young carers who are more vulnerable. But even there, you know, we've done a recent audit and it shows that 70% of our young carers we believe would benefit from child's plans actually have them in place. So 30% haven't. There's also quite wide use of level one forms, which is to just register, you know, some additional responsibilities, but 
seeing that young carers eh are managed coping well and there’s just initial recognition that there’s additional support need there. We then find you that, you know, if they do go on to get a child’s plan, that the step down from that isn’t really in place. So, once they come off that child’s plan, if it’s decided that it’s no longer required, we don’t believe that the level one is sufficient. So having the statement I think would provide much more security and I think stronger support mechanisms for the young carer. And transition time absolutely into adulthood, I think there’s been a major gap there for a long time that needs to be closed and that would be one very useful way of doing it. When we’re talking about transition though, I would also like to flag up the real need for transition when young carers are going through bereavement. Eh, because quite often, you know, we’re working with young carers for fifteen months after bereavement because they’re not just losing the person that they love in their lives, but they’re often losing their purpose and their role within the family. Some of them are actually losing their homes, some of them are losing their schools, and some of them are using- losing their friends. So, we would say that that’s when actually more intense support should be in place for them. Also those young carers who are going into care, local authority care, that there’s some transition support in place there again because it’s not just the loss of the family and although they can be, you know, still getting connection with the family, they’re also losing that care role and that can add almost like an additional bereavement process for them. Can I actually thank you for putting on record something I don’t think the committee has particularly looked at in terms of eh transition planning and that is when- when- when you lose a loved one, you’ve been- perhaps you’ve been providing the caring role for that loved one and they’re- they’re no longer there. That’s not something we’ve particularly looked at as a committee. What we did put some evidence on, eh, in the earlier session was the idea of emergency planning and anticipatory planning and if- if you’ve got a loved one who, eh, has- has a life shortening or- or terminal condition, um, the planning that is then put in place by the local authority and the health board and others to provide support, as you say, bereavement counselling or whatever needs to be put in place. Now, you mentioned that seventy percent- you estimate about seventy percent of young carers have been identified where- where you are. Is there much evidence of that kind of anticipatory planning going on at the moment? Yeah, it’s- it’s difficult to quantify and I think that is the issue for us that I think there will always be, you know, some hidden young carers out there and part of that can be because of family culture and, you know, we do have travelling families in the area as well, so there’s all that- there’s also, you know, young carers who are home educated. Now, they are not picked up by the schools, the same- they’re not seen by the school nurses, they’re not seen by many services at all, especially if they’ve never registered in school and we, you know, see them as very vulnerable young carers because they don’t get monitoring by other services and support mechanisms in place to the same level. Okay, and in terms of- I did ask two separate questions there, I don’t think I was as focused- and I don’t think I was as focused as I could have been, so that- that’s quite helpful in terms of identifying young carers and I actually think it’s a strength that you’ve managed to identify seventy percent. I suspect what you’re doing there is better than we’re doing in other parts of- of the country and maybe some of that work around GPs and flagging might- might be an explanation for that. So, whilst I know you’re keen to identify every young carer, you- you appear to be doing- doing well there. I was asking about- and it’s very difficult to- to quantify, so I’m not looking for numbers if- but if you’re aware of where there are young carers who maybe have a loved one who does have a terminal condition, whether there’s any planning takes place to ensure before tragically the inevitable happens that support is put in place to anticipate the need for the like of bereavement counselling and additional support. Does any of that take place at the moment, do you think? Yeah, certainly in the Sky Welsh area it does, but I think I need to clarify first the seventy percent. Apologies if I wasn’t clear on that. I was saying that seventy percent of young carers that we’ve identified and worked with have child’s plans in place. Okay, that we believe should have child’s plans in place.
now that we've identified safety protecting gun carriers in our area, because I don't think you know I don't think we could say any kind of figure on that because it, it is an unknown. So apologies for that. No, I I think that was my misunderstanding, but thank you for uh, correcting me on the record in, in relation to that. So we've got some certainty. I appreciate that. Now, just just in terms of, and I, I won't ask again. It's just in terms of because I, I don't think we've explored the area of transition and anticipatory yes. planning for for whether there's a terminal illness. Just to clarify, yes. there there is some evidence of that taking place, is there? Yes, we do do pre bereavement support, and we start that about a year if we're fortunate enough to engage with that family and young carer in time. Then we do work with the family and that young carer to prepare things like, you know, memory boxes in advance, making positive memories for that young young carer so that any special wishes they have to work with the family, to achieve things within their family before that death, that those are achieved if at all possible, and that young carers we give them opportunities through creative art particularly to give the messages to maybe mum, dad or brother and sister that they maybe have problems verbalising at home but they can create that in a safe environment and then share to the level that has made such a difference that some young carers have actually, the parent has asked for those possessions to be put in their coffins with them when they are died uh, and that I don't think you can undervalue you know, the difference that, that makes to the whole family. Um, thank you for that, Marjorie. I, I am going to give, yeah, I was, I, I'm just going to briefly, Dennis, I am going to give you the last word in a, a second, Marjorie, uh, but I just want to make sure that um, any of my MSP colleagues have got any further questions. See, Dennis has, has indicated, if someone else could you catch my eye now, it will be your last opportunity to get in. So, uh, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Marjorie, and I, I, I fully endorse what you're saying about the um, aspect of memory boxes, etc. Um, when we talk about loved ones, are you aware in terms of, if we're looking at uh, whether it be a parent or sibling, are you aware in terms of the carers, how many are supporting young siblings as opposed to supporting parents? Uh, and again, this would sort of move on towards the bereavement as well. The, at the moment, consistently for quite a number of years, the majority of young carers are supporting mothers predominantly, and then you know fathers to about twenty odd percent, and then and the, it's a smaller group I would say that are supporting siblings because usually they do have the parental support in place there, so they're not so often the primary carer when it comes to sibling support. Yeah, but they co can very often be the primary carer when it comes to supporting the adults or adults in the family. We had 19 young carers supporting more than one person in the family. So that could be either both parents or a parent and a sibling. And I think the impact of that sometimes isn't recognised, but also the impact that it has on young carers if they themselves have a condition or a disability or chronic illness. And, then, and sometimes that can be you know, addressed in additional support needs, but the young carer element is under-recognised so that the impact isn't really addressed. And we've found in schools that although all the schools know that they have young carers and who they are within their schools, that only 20% of them are actually recorded on the pupil database for additional support needs as being young carers. And I think that's an issue that we're hoping that the young carer support statement will help to address for us. Uh, and finally, convener for me, it, one thing that came to mind when you were talking, Marjorie, is are we aware in terms of the travelling community and the young carers that are involved within the travelling community? Yet not to the level that we should be or would like to be, but we ha we certainly have had you know people from the travelling community that have come, but more those that have settled even for short periods of time in the area, who have come to us and built trust through their own community with even just having one or two 
on our membership who I maybe were previous travellers that are now settled, they still have those networks and they still connect with each other and so they will, you know, if they see the benefit, help to promote, you know, referral to the service. Travellers always say they're travellers even if they become static. Uh-huh. <laughs> they still, because of that culture, they will still class themselves as travellers. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, f thank you, Dennis. There have been no other bids from uh, MSP colleagues to ask questions. Marjorie, as I said, I want to give you the last word. Um, uh, so are there any thoughts or reflections or, or hopes that you have for this bill um, or indeed things you would like to perhaps see changed within the bill that you would like to put on record before we close this particular ev evidence session, Marjorie? Okay, I think for us as a small independent charity up in Sky and the Hush, I think access to funding is you know, a key issue for us. You know, we get about 30% from local authority to support the rest. As well as delivering our services, we have to fundraise, we have to do our applications and do our reports. And I think that reduces you know, our capacity. And for with local authority or service level agreements, at the moment we're seeing that on an annual basis. That doesn't allow us the time for planning. And we are always having to look at contingency plans in case the funding is reduced. And, then, and it has been standstill for a number of years, which again, you know, is really in reality a reduction for us. And we would like to see, you know, more equity of service provision across Scotland and particularly across Highland as a very rural area because there is only two specialist young theatre services within Highland and that's Sky in the Hulsh and Up in Sutherland and I think you know there is a huge identified need for more resources to go in to, to Highland to actually start up services that would make a significant difference to the lives of these vulnerable but you know very very it's difficult to say, I think for young carers, very, very special children who don't ask for much but give so much to others. Right. Marjorie, um, I'm glad I gave you the opportunity to put all that on the record at the end. I think it's quite important when we when we look at our evidence for this bill. All that remains left for is, on behalf of I think my fellow committee members as well, uh, to thank you for your excellent evidence this morning uh, to the committee. So can I thank Marjorie Jagger? Uh, for taking the time to give evidence this morning and uh, we'll say goodbye to you now Marjorie and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. A, a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so as indicated we'll now move on to agenda item 5 uh, which is consideration of petition PE 1550 by Andrew Muir on behalf of Psychiatric Rights Scotland calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to set up a public inquiry into historical cases of abuse of people detained under the Mental Health Scotland Act 1984 and the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. This was referred to us by the Public Petitions Committee at the end of March in order that we may consider it in the context of our scrutiny of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. In doing so, the Public Petitions Committee also wrote to the Scottish Government seeking its views on the petition. The Scottish Government response was received yesterday afternoon and circulated to the committee. Uh, you will have seen the paper from the clerks which recommends that we consider the information contained in the petition and the response from the Scottish Government when it is received in the context of our scrutiny of the Mental Health Scotland Bill at stage two following which the petition would then be closed. Uh, before I seek your agreement for that approach uh, to uh, our um, uh, work in, in relation to this petition, can I ask members if they have any comments to make? Okay, there being no... Just anyone? No? There being no comments to make, uh, can I uh, reiterate then that... Um, we will look at the issues raised within this petition during our stage two scrutiny of the bill in, in due course, after which the petition uh, will be closed if we get committee agreement. Can I ask the committee if they are agreed? Okay. 
Thank you. So, as previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session, and I will pause briefly to allow, at this point, the public gallery to clear. Thank you.